Well, Jennifer, it's so great to have you here for this conversation. And I know you are a scholar, but you are an athlete as well. And I know you believe in the power of sport to kind of transform society. So why don't we begin there and tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, the power of sport. I think sport, it's like art, literature, dance, theater. It's, a, it's an expression of humanity. But I think sport is the fullest expression because it actually, it adds that element of competition and it teaches us how we can challenge one another respectfully and productively. I also think it's powerful because of the reach, right? Uh, it is the most watched endeavor in the world. So more people watch the Olympics than anything else. Something I know you've been thinking about a lot and you've been writing about too is the problem of abuse in sports as well. And we've seen over the last little while lots of stories. I mean, you know, two examples obviously in hockey and soccer. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what what that's about, what's going on there and why. I think hockey in particular has been a, a very powerful case because it's illustrated, you know, patriarchy and discrimination and misogyny are dead. We're not dealing with it anymore. And you can see that from a number of people in sport public. But, but it's, a, it's a sport culture that upholds those things still, the violence and the misogyny and, and is what led to the, the crisis in hockey. So we're seeing the flaws, we're seeing the issues. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the focus on the win in particular and why that's problematic. Yeah, so I think it links to, you know, what are we protecting in sport? And when we put win at the center or at the top, you know, if you think in hierarchies, we, we privilege winning over everything else. And then we end up compromising other things. It's truly that win at all cost kind of approach. We'll lose out on health, well-being, fun, and uh, camaraderie, you know, and we start privileging the medal. And our, our funding structure is actually structured in that way that it's about who will win a medal. That's who gets the funding and support. And we need to restructure that. It's dangerous as well because it's, it's really putting sport at risk. Um, if it's not fun, if it's not something you're gonna emerge from healthy and intact, why would anybody subscribe to it? And, and then we lose out on all the power of sport that we talked about at the beginning. Now you've also, I know, spoken about the cost that survivors of abuse face as well. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the challenges they face. Yeah, and there's some great research being done. You know, Canada is really leading the way in terms of research around abuse in sport and safe sport. And, protection of children and one well there are these this thought that there are three levels of trauma that a, and a victim may experience intrapersonally so this is even just when they're trying to disclose or report what's happened to them there it's you can imagine how hard it is to actually even become aware of what they've been through and then interpersonal when they decide to share it with someone they might not be believed, they might be accused or victim blamed, right? And then socioculturally, they'll experience further trauma because if it becomes public, and Sheldon Kennedy talks lots about this, he was damned at first for what he was saying about Graham James. So that can be really tough because the norms around sport are so problematic still. Yeah. I mean, what I find extraordinary is just how long this can go on. I mean, some of the cases in, in abuse in sport in university settings, as an example, some cases in the States. I mean, people knew this was going on for decades and did absolutely nothing about it. It's extraordinary just how they protected those abusers. Right? And there's that protectionism yeah. again. And I think the problem is, is we tip so quickly into complicity. So I really would like to talk a little more about the work that you're doing in the area of leadership communication and sport. and. You know, what has your research sort of told you about how we weed out some of these issues that we were just talking about? Yeah, it's a couple of things, really. Um, we, need to, we need to establish power balance in our system. Yeah. So right now, it's very much a hierarchy. It's what we know in society. So that's why I love sport again, too. It's a real metaphor for the rest yeah. of the world, and we can learn from it. But, you know, we, we're used to these hierarchies. If we can become partners, um, then we're going to balance power. And then, and then we won't have abuse of power and we won't have people reluctant to challenge 
that abuse to power because they're not imbalanced, you know, and lacking power or vulnerable. Athletes in particular are particularly, sorry, are particularly vulnerable because they love sports so much. Sure. So they will compromise. They will be gaslit quite easily because they'll be told this is normal, this behavior, or you know, you coming into my room as a coach is, is okay somehow. So they'll, they'll question their reality a little more because they are so caught up in the passion of the sport. Um, how do we balance that power? It's totally possible, but we need to commit to it and we need to understand it's possible to actually um, have that kind of a partnership relationship. We can learn from sport. Because when you think about truly the, the premise of sport is that the coach and athlete are partners in achieving a shared goal. The true leader is the goal, the standard of excellence in behavior and, and uh, yeah. performance. It isn't uh, a medal and it's not obeying the coach, right? So. Yeah. Well, Jennifer, thank you so much. I mean, thank you for the incredible work you're doing in this space the sort of leadership you're taking, you. um, it's, it's incredible. I'm so proud that this is happening here at Royal Roads. I know you are connected to people across the country, but uh, it's just a fascinating conversation and just the best of luck on this really, really important work. Well, thank you. And I, I really think Royal Roads is where it can happen best, frankly, because of our model and our approach to social change. So yeah. it's been such a pleasure and thanks for the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thanks.